Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. Good morning, how are you? Doing well? Awesome, if you, it sounds like you're doing great. Uh, if you have your Bibles, grab those. We're gonna be in Exodus chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible around you, there should be a hardback black one. You don't own one, that's our gift to you. Uh, while you're turning there, I want to spend uh, some time uh, as a community of faith praying. Um, uh, while most of us slept, I know not all of us, but while most of us slept, uh, last night in Orlando, Florida, uh, occurred the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. Uh, and so a man went into a gay bar called Pulse and there shot and killed 53 people before the police uh, shot and killed him. This man is of Muslim descent, and so there's all this conversation going on right now about whether this was an act of terror or this was a hate crime or what exactly this was. But, but I wanna talk about this event on, on two levels. Uh, first, I want us to pray because it's horrific and awful. Um, secondly, I want to lay before you two things that are occurring right now. Uh, um, one, uh, if you have a friend or family member in the LBGT community, it, this would be a good time just to make a call, check in, see if they're all right. We, most of us will not live in the kind of environment where you're nervous about you being murdered as a hate crime in any moment or anything like that. And so if you want to call and touch base, how are you in light of this news? Uh, how can I pray for you? That, that's a good thing. The, the second thing to consider is that every Muslim neighbor and coworker you have right now is going, oh, great. Because once again, they're gonna feel like we um, think they're all terrorists and we think, and maybe you're ignorant enough to actually believe that. But in reality, as Afshin Ziafat taught us back in January, as a man who moved here with his family from Iran and, and faced really the cultural distrust and hatred at the hands of Americans, it, it was literally uh, someone who counseled him in English, who gave him a Bible that led to him becoming uh, a Christian. And so uh, if you have friends or family members in the LBGT community, this is an opportunity for you to call and check in, see how you can pray, encourage them. And if you have uh, uh, neighbors who are Muslim, family members who are Muslim, coworkers who are Muslim, this is also an opportunity for you to love and be the presence of Christ for them. And so what, what I want to do is give us a few moments here to just pray, uh, to put humanity on this. There are 53 moms and dads who just lost their child. There are 53 brothers and sisters who lost um, sisters and brothers. There's all sorts of loss that just occurred in Orlando, and we should grieve the brokenness of this world. And, and so I want to give us an opportunity to mourn with those who mourn and lament the brokenness of the world that we live in, because in no level can you look at what happened in Orlando and think anything about it is good. And, and so I, I want us to be mindful of the brokenness of the world that we're in. Today will be a heavier day, even by topic, but I want us to start just by praying for these family members, praying that God would be at work in the mess. That's what we believe as Christians, that the world is messy, but that God is at work in the mess. And so we wanna pray and, and ask for comfort for these families, ask for mercy for those involved, and really just ask the Spirit of God to be at work. And so um, how we do that here at the village is, is if you've come with some people that are Christians, you can kind of group up with them and pray. Uh, we'll just full on embrace awkwardness here so you don't even have to know them. Just lean in, go praying with you guys here by myself and we'll love that. Um, if you're not a Christian uh, and you're here just because some wacko religious nut job family member drug you, then we're glad you're here also and you can awkwardly stare at me or, or you can pray or um, 
happy thoughts to the higher power. Whatever you want to do, I want you to feel welcomed and comfortable. We love that you're here with us today. So let me give you just a couple of moments here to pray for these families, for this terrible situation. Uh, The saints in the first century would often cry out, Maranatha, which means come quickly. Lord Jesus, make sense of this madness. And so let me give you a, a couple of moments to pray here, and then I'll close us out. Father, we thank you for your sovereign reign and rule. But we confess this morning, much like the Apostle Paul um, confesses in the scriptures, that we are perplexed but not crushed. So we pray for these families. We pray um, for those who have suffered great loss today. Uh, We pray that we might be marked as a people of compassion and grace. Um, that that whatever we read about on Facebook or whatever foolishness gets echoed out in other social media platforms, that we not join in with stupidity and foolishness, but rather we be marked as your people, those who mourn with those who mourn. Ask, Father, that where this touches those near and dear or around us as you've uniquely wired and placed us in the world, that we might be agents of salt and light, compassionate, Um, helpful, encouraging. And Father, we ask that this madness might come to an end. Um, Father, that you might work according to your good pleasure for justice, for freedom, and, and ultimately so that men and women might see you as beautiful and delightful. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Um, A.W. Tozer said, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Now, let me try to explain Tozer's argument. Um, Tozer's saying that when you think about God, what you think about God will shape everything about you. It'll shape how you interact with others in your relationships. It'll uh, shape how you interact with your finance. It will literally shape everything about your life. And so I'll, I'll expand on Tozer's argument, not knowing whether or not he would agree with my interpretation of what he said, because he's dead. And so that creates some license for me because he's not here to argue, but, but reading this book, he, here's the conclusion that I, that I think Tozer is making. If in your mind, when you think about God, you think that he is gracious and kind and loving and forgiving, then, then when you think about God, that, that thought about God then shapes your ability to be gracious and generous to others. So if I believe that God is generous and gracious, then I am more likely to be gracious and generous to others because to be a recipient of grace, to be a recipient of generosity usually shapes and forms us to be the same kind of people that that we have been shaped and molded by the God that we believe in. On the flip side of things, if you believe that God is perpetually disappointed in you, that every time God sees you, he just kind of has just a, a kind of a, a retching kind of reaction, like he's just so weary of you and your nonsense, then, then more than likely, all right, far more likely than if you believe God is a God of grace and mercy, um, you're going to have kind of this low-grade agitation because you're never quite able to measure up and you don't even know what the standard is and how dare he, and, and then that bleeds into your relationship with others and how you handle your finances. So to see God properly, correctly in his his context in the, the scriptures is to have really the whole of our lives ordered in a way that, that I would argue is beautiful and right and good. And to see God wrongly um, means that, that man, we, we will make a mess of things even with our best intentions. And, and so when we tend to think about God, and, and that's a complex idea, like right, what pops in your head when you think about God, I mean, that, that's pretty big. And, and so what I've noticed is in 2016 and last weekend, if you're, I spent 27 minutes on the enlightenment in my intro, right? Who does 27 minutes of intro on the enlightenment? Well, what I was trying to get to the bottom of, because I knew where I was going this week, is to show you that, that at, at its core, in the enlightenment seeks to boil men and women down to brains on a stick, that we are purely our intellect. And, and we, we know from history and we know from our own experience that this is simply not true. There are all sorts of things we feel and ways we behave that are contrary to what we know is true in our minds. We're not brains on a stick. We're far more complex than that as human beings. And one of the things, one of the ideas of who God is, a character attribute of God that has completely vanished in 2016 for all sorts of various reasons, I, but I think is an important one, is the idea of the Lord being a, a warrior. So when we think about God, we tend to think about Nickelodeon, not HBO, right? We, take a, we tend to think about Bambi, not Braveheart. 
Uh, we tend to like the God who's a lot more like Tinkerbell than anything else. What we want is feathered hair, Jesus, a lot of product to hold that thing in place. He's got a bag of pixie dust, and all he does is he sprinkles. He never gets upset about anything. You can't do anything wrong. We're all awesome, and his sprinkle dust is there to help you understand that, by golly, you're amazing. And, and that, that tends to be the only palatable version of Jesus that culture at large will buy into. And although you cannot outpreach the grace, mercy, long-suffering, patience, and kindness of God, make no mistake, the, God, the Bible paints God also as a warrior. And so we're going to talk about that today. And, and so hang in there because it might not mean what you think it means. So to, to under, let's look at this text, Exodus 15.3. It's simple. It's a sentence. Right, it's just one sentence. The Lord, or, or Yahweh, right? The, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Okay, so if we're going to understand the Lord as a warrior in any kind of real biblical way, we've got to kind of back up and see the whole narrative, the whole story of what God is up to in the world that we live in. So the the Bible tells us that when God created everything that existed, uh, he created it perfect, that he, that he created it with not, not balance, but, but honest perfection, that there was joy. He, he describes the relationship between the man and woman like this. They were naked and unashamed. That had nothing to do with nudity and everything to do with the state of their heart, that they were naked and unashamed, right? So there was no guilt and there was no shame. Like, can you imagine never feeling guilt or shame? That's creation as God created it. The man and woman were naked and unashamed, which means they had nothing to hide. They projected no false image of themselves. They were what they were. There was innocence, beauty. The Hebrews called this idea shalom. Think of a symphony with all the instruments playing their part. It was beautiful, rhythmic. It stirred the senses and the affection. It's called shalom, and this is how God created the world to function. No shame. No guilt. So guilt is the breaking of a law. Shame is just brokenness of human spirit. You can feel shame over all sorts of things. Some things that are shameful, but sometimes you can just feel shame because your heart's broken. Like you can be ashamed of what you drive, or you can be ashamed of how you look, or you can be ashamed of your friend, or you can be ashamed of where you live, or you be right. But but that's not rooted in the breaking of a commandment. That's just the brokenness of our hearts or giving ourselves over to what is shameful, right? Uh, and and so in this, the, the Bible says this is shalom. This is the world as God created it to be. On top of that, we see that, that before things break, before we get to the world that we live in now, that even the creative order uh, is wired in such a way that, that it's perfect, that what we see now as beautiful is just a shadow or a shell of what it once was and what it eventually will be again. Uh, we, we know this um, be, because the, the Bible's going to tell us in Romans 8 that creation groans to be free from the bondage of decay, uh, which means that, that at, at the beginning that creation somehow uh, did not need to die for more life to, to spring up in its place. And if you're asking me biologically how that happens, I got a great answer for you. No clue. Right? I'm 42. God's infinite. We're not going to see the same way all that much. But I can look to the cross and I can trust that he is faithful and good. And so if we're going to understand now the world we live in, because can we just agree real quick, that doesn't sound a lot like our week, right? Unison, purity, beauty, no relational strife, even the creative order humming the praises of God. Most of us are going, not my week. I, my, my wife and I fought three, four, five thousand times. Uh, dog chewed up my favorite book. Kid apparently can block out my voice, right? This is, uh, I've struggled with some anxiety. I've had some fears. I don't know what this is. That's the world that we live in. We live in a world where a guy walks into a nightclub and kills 53 people. That, that's the world that you and I live in. So, so how did we get from Genesis 1 and 2 to to where we are now. Well, I'm glad you asked. That was actually the next part of my notes. So, um, but we have to actually get before Genesis 1 and 2. And, and here's, uh, well, I'm gonna start talking and you're gonna think, this sounds a lot like late night TV, specifically on the Sci-Fi channel. Um, but, but I would say, once again, that shows how marked we are by the Enlightenment, how marked we are by modernity that would consider 
everything a matter of empiricism. Can I touch it? Can I taste it? Can I feel it? Can I hear it? Can I smell it? If I can't, it doesn't exist. We know that's not true, but, but any talk of supernatural realities and cosmic powers makes us think more of late night sci-fi than, than it does cosmic realities. And so the Bible tells us that there is war in heaven and that an angel named Lucifer and, and a group of demons jealous of the glory of God leads a battle against God in heaven and they lose and they're cast out. Now back to our perfect garden. You have Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the garden naked and unashamed. And here comes the serpent and the serpent says to Eve, did God really say that you should not eat of this fruit. Really what, what God is up to is God doesn't want you to become like him. He doesn't want you to be your own God. And so he's telling you not to eat of this because he doesn't want you to be God. Eve takes the bait, her moron husband just standing there bird watching or something. Who knows what he's doing, all right? But he's definitely not paying attention right now because Eve's being lied to and they're like, well, I named that, Blue Jay. <laughs> And then she eats of the fruit, hands it to him, he eats of it. The fruit's not magical. This is about obedience and the joy that comes in obedience. And at that, the shalom fractures and the symphony and beauty and rhythm of God's created order spins off into chaos. In fact, relational harmony fractures in a moment. The second they eat the fruit, the Bible says they realized they were naked and they ran and hid. What a heartbreaking passage of scripture. For the first time, shame takes hold of the human heart. And what they do, they ran and hid. And man has been running and hiding ever since. So they hear the Lord walking in the garden and they're anxious about that. They hide, most futile game of hide and go seek in the history of mankind. It's not gonna hide from an all-knowing God. It's like little kids when they lay on the floor and think, hey, they can't see me, so uh, you know, I, I can't see them because my eyes are closed, so they can't see me. You're like, you're in the middle of the floor, bud. Yeah, I'm, I'm standing over you right now. So Adam and Eve, they go and hide, and, and God finds them because God finds us. Uh, and then in that moment, there's this weird act of compassion despite their fact, the fact that Adam and Eve had sided with the enemy and had foregone their allegiance to the creator God who created this beautiful symphony of enjoyment and praise and worship, and, and they instead joined the rebellion. God made them close. Isn't that a strange moment? Like you're betrayed by the, by the apex of your created order, man and woman alone, made in the image of God, viceroys. Stewards of your creation sided with your enemy. They feel naked. They feel ashamed. And God made them close. Now, God's response to his creation siding with the enemy was to, now hear this, redeem and reconcile all things to himself. That's God's big play. It's the most infinitely powerful thing in the universe does not set out to now destroy and annihilate his creation that joined his enemy, but rather to seek and save and redeem them. Any talk of God being a warrior must be plugged into that narrative because that is the story of the Bible. And so when we talk about God being a warrior, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk, uh, th this grid that I'm using is a, a man by the name of Tremper Longman, um, who is a historical, biblical um, researcher, PhD. You just hear smarter than me, much, much, much smarter than me. He's gonna divide God's warring into five cosmic stages. I mean, even doesn't even that sentence sound like the sci-fi network, right? Five cosmic stages. It sounds like somebody should be like doing the intro like of a trailer. God's five cosmic stages, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but here's where, what they are. We'll, we'll just outline them and I'll try to explain why this is such good news and not bad news. Stage one, God fights for Israel. And then what Longman, Longman's going to do is he's going to look at Exodus, the conquest of Canaan, and then the Davidic kingdom as this stage of God warring. And so let, let's think about it. Um, the people of God are enslaved in Egypt, 
right? They're, they're enslaved, they are oppressed, and God begins to war to free his people. In fact, uh, we'll get into this a lot in the fall when we're walking through the book of Exodus, but every plague that God pours out on Egypt corresponds with an Egyptian god. So God is actively warring, destroying, killing false gods and idolatrous worship that enslave, chain, and break mankind's potential to be all that he designed them to be in worship, joy, and gladness. So the Egyptians worshipped the Nile, so he turned the Nile to blood. They worshipped cattle, and so God killed the livestock. They worshipped the god of the crops, and so God sent locusts to devour the, the crops. They worshipped the sun god Ra, right? If you even watch movies, you would know that one, right? And, and yet God then blacks out the sky and makes it pitch black, right? For every, and this is what makes the people of God so insufferable when they get into the wilderness and immediately form a golden calf to worship. Had God not already flexed his might over that false non-existent God? Well, he absolutely had. This is God making war. Now, uh, if we're looking at him, them being delivered out of slavery, really, if you're familiar with any of kind of the new atheism or kind of the arguments of those uh, who refuse to kind of enter into dialogue about Christianity, what really kind of the ace of spades that'll get played over and over again is the conquest of Canaan. Uh, they'll be like, oh, your God, a, a maniac, right? He's a genocidal uh, maniac. He kills women and children and slaughters whole people groups. Can't believe you would worship that God. In fact, uh, I'll let Richard Dawkins say it. He says it better than I can. This is from his book, The God Delusion. The Bible is a blueprint of in-group morality, complete with instructions for genocide, enslavement of outgroups, and world domination. Now, now a couple of things. I, I think Richard Dawkins was a brilliant intellect. I would also probably like to argue that I'm not sure that he ever read the Bible. Now, I am fully convinced that he has pulled some texts out of the Bible, but I'm not quite sure that he actually read the Bible. And, and, and here's why. He, he tends to favor, in all of his writings, he, he tends to favor pulling these two verses out of Joshua, this one verse out of Exodus, and ignoring the narrative in which those verses find themselves. So what he does is he goes to June 6th, 1944, and he finds a 20-something-year-old storming the beach at Normandy, killing everything that's in front of him and going, see, he's a monster. This kid is a monster. When that's not what's happening at all. That's not what's happening at all. In fact, the long-suffering patience of God is stunning when it comes to the Canaanites. This July, next month, the United States will turn 240 years old. Should be a pretty epic party, 240, right? I mean, that's a big year. That's not like your 40th or 50th. That's your 240th. Uh, and so we've got that coming next week. Celebrate well. Um, the Bible tells us that God gave the Canaanites 400 years to repent. Repent of what? The type of idolatrous worship where babies were sacrificed to God's? where elderly were killed because they lacked no good purpose in society, where anyone with any deformity was put to death, the idea of being a mountain baby, they would, they would look and see if there was any defect and then fling you off of a cliff down into your death. And so for 400 years, overtures are made towards the people of the Canaanite lands to repent of this idolatry to disavow their allegiance to what's called the dominion of darkness and line up with the good graces of God, and they refused. This is stage one of God's warfare. Stage two, and, and this is interesting to note, God then begins to fight against Israel in judgment. So stage one, he fights for Israel. Stage two, he fights against Israel. So what happens is, as Israel kind of gets into the promised land, is now um, they actually begin to worship these pagan gods. And so they take on the rituals uh, of those who, who God had sought to destroy beforehand, right? They begin to do the same things that these peoples judged by God were going to do, his own people betray. I mean, think of how foolish the people of God are. Right? God destroys livestock in Egypt to show his power over the little g, non-existent idol of the livestock, God. And what happens as soon as they get into the promised land? We don't know what to do. Make a golden calf so we can worship it. Not the sharpest knives in the drawer. And, and don't we are among them, brothers and sisters. And so then God sends prophets and pleads with the people to return to the good design of God's thou shalts and thou shalt nots. 
for human flourishing, for joy, for justice to return. The Bible's clear that the people of God were stiff-necked people. They refused, and so God warred against them. And that takes us to stage three. Stage three, um, and, and again, if you know your Bible, this is the exile and the, the latter prophets who, who then, like Jeremiah, declare, um, listen, if we do not repent, God is going to scatter us uh, across the world. We will no longer have a place of our own. We will be scattered, and sure enough, if you know your Bible, the, the people of God are scattered throughout the ancient world. In fact, what we see when Jesus comes and walks the earth is the people uh, of Israel are, are spread across the Roman Empire. There are little communities of faith that are in almost every major city and in almost every um, major town in the ancient world. This is why when the Apostle Paul, who hated Jesus, actually tried to stomp out and kill Christians and then became a Christian himself, actually went to those synagogues first to share the gospel. This is all a part of God warring against Israel and dispersing them out of the promised land across all of the known world. And that brings us to stage four, and we're gonna spend a lot of time in stage four. Stage four of God's warfare, Jesus comes as the divine deliverer, and he defeats the power of evil, Satan, and death. And so let me kind of talk about how this works here, all right? First John chapter five, verse four, it says this. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So this is an interesting statement coming from John, right? John is saying that anyone born of God has overcome the world. What does that mean, overcome the world? We're certainly not overcome the world in some sort of military way. Certainly and overcome the world in some sort of violent way. This certainly does not look like stage one, stage two, or stage three. This is all together different. Christ has entered the scene. He has lived. He has died. He has resurrected. Resurrected, and now, as men and women come to know and put their faith in Christ, they are set free, not from the brokenness of this world, but through the bondage of sin, death, and decay. That what it means to be the people of God is not that we do not sin, but that we are free from it. Are you tracking with me? Like the people of God are not perfect people. Do you know any of them? Are you one? Do you know yourself? Well, you're not perfect. I'm not. No, there are no. There's a perfect Savior, not any perfect church folk. We'll talk more about that in a second. But at the coming of Christ, now warfare looks different. We have overcome the world because the power of Satan, sin, and death no longer holds anchor in our hearts. And that's how the victory is won. And you get a greater sense of this when um, the Bible starts talking about cosmic realities. Again, we're children of the enlightenment. Cosmic realities are hard for us. It's not hard for us if we're watching the, the Matrix. We love that nonsense on the Matrix. But if we actually think about the world working that way, then, then all of a sudden we're filled with skepticism. Um, Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 13. We're, he's very much going to talk uh, about personal salvation at the beginning of this. I think you'll be able to relate to that if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, this is what we mean by personal personal salvation. Colossians 2, starting in verse 13. You can plug your name in here if you would like. I'll plug mine in as I read. And Matt Chandler was dead in his trespasses and the uncircumcision of his flesh, of my heart. But God made me alive together with him, having forgiven Matt Chandler of all his trespasses and by canceling the record of debt that stood against Matt with its legal demand, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So all that I am guilty of nailed to the cross of Christ with Jesus Christ. That's great news. That's personal salvation. In that text, we read about how God saved me and redeemed me. We read about in this text what David was talking about in Psalm 40 and then and Bono would sing about later on the U2 album with the song 40 that God heard my cry and he lifted me out of the muck and the mire and he set my feet on a rock. He put a hem of praise in my mouth, a hem of praise to my God. That's personal salvation. But yet there's something that happens here also. Look at verse 15. In this, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, what rulers and authorities are put to open shame when we become Christians? It's not a governmental authority. It's not a parental authority. What authority is it that's put to open shame when we become Christians? Well, I mean, he's talking about cosmic realities here. He's talking about Satan and demons and spiritual powers. So, so think about it. Here's what um, being laid open to shame means. 
Um, we, we are born broken, born with bents, right? That, that are far, moving us far from God, not moving us towards God, right? Nobody's born going, oh, I'm gonna be fully submissive to the God of the Bible. Nobody's born that way. We're all born with bents towards rebellion. Every one of us. David says, I was brought forth in iniquity, right? If you've been around kids, you know that it's not always environment. Uh, I can tell you this. I have never bit my wife or another human being to get what I want, ever, <laughs> So my children did not learn that by watching Lauren and I get in arguments. <laughs> give me the remote, boo. I'm, give me the remote. I mean, that did not happen. They did not watch Lauren and I and go, that's how you do it. No, no, no. It's just their little hearts are evil. <laughs> right? Their little hearts are broken. They need to be redeemed. And if you're going, oh, that's not the way my child acts. My child is, yes, father. <laughs> sure, mother then I'd keep your eye on that kid even more. Maybe lock your door at night. That's stuff like it that's in like paranormal activity right there, right? Um, here we are talking about demons. I'm, anyway, uh, it, it, in the end, what's been disarmed, what's been disarmed and what's been laid to open shame is that in our flesh, drawn by demonic powers and forces, we give ourselves over to all sorts of wicked and depraved things. And then when we are saved and baptized, we testify to Christ's power over those things. And in that, God then triumphs over Satan in a very public way. Uh, and so one of the things I love about the Village Church is, is historically we've just been a really grimy place, right? I mean, we, uh, I, I use these illustrations all the time. When we, we've had a guy in the bathroom with a needle stuck in his arm and had to dial 911. Our, our baptism services are always almost NC-17. You know, you just, sometimes I want to get up before and go, okay, probably want to take your kids out for these services, right? Unless you want to try to explain why swinging is a bad thing and, and really kind of what happens when drugs and other type of wicked things rule and reign over the hearts of men. But what happens when somebody gets in the water and says, I cheated on my spouse? What happens when they get in the water and say, I gave myself over to drunkenness and licentiousness? When they say those things to strangers, 1,500 strangers, what they're saying to all is that the love of Christ triumphs over the sin. And then what Satan meant for evil and destruction, what our flesh meant to destroy us is now a treasure and a trophy of the grace of God. It's why celebration service is such a big thing here because in it we're reminded that God's triumph over sin and death in Christ is complete, that there is no sin with more power than the cross of Christ. There's no one that's gone too far. You can't out -sin the grace of God. And that's what this is all about. Satan and demons thinking they're getting the best of a situation only to have it flipped on its head to show Christ's triumph over it all. And then I want to show you 3, 8 through 10 because I think it speaks to the truth, the church in a way that's helpful. I'm sorry I'm drinking water today. Some Dallas air quality, poor. <laughs> Ephesians 3, starting in verse 8. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints... This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles, that's us, the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Look at verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. Now, I, I want to stop there. Um, if you've ever really just kind of looked up at the church, I'm going to be honest. This looks like a really bad plan. Right? Like if I'm looking at the evil and brokenness of the world, if I'm looking at all the heinous, horrific, dark, if I'm looking at uh, poverty, if I'm looking at sex trafficking, if I'm looking at a billion just evil, wicked, grotesque, dark things, and then I look up at us, I mean, seriously, look around the room for a second. Go ahead. Don't stare at one person in particular. <laughs> but just look around the room. Like this is God's big plan to push back that? This, like, I just think we need to probably go back to the whiteboard on this. Just looking around, just concerned that this, this probably isn't the wisest plan. And yet, the wisdom of God is not being revealed to human eyes, but rather to something else. So let's look back at 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So what God is doing in the church, what God is doing in Christians and Christians in covenant community with one another is revealing his wisdom, not just to mankind, because we might look really foolish to mankind. 
but to spiritual powers and authorities and rulers. So one of my uh, favorite uh, authors, C.S. Lewis, he was actually a professor at Oxford in Cambridge, and uh, medieval literature was kind of his specialty. Um, uh, he wrote a book called The Screw Tape Letters, right? And in The Screw Tape Letters, um, w- what he's doing, he's just brilliant with storytelling, and Lewis uh, is telling, uh, the whole book is about a, a, an older demon discipling a younger demon named Wormwood on how to deceive this man who's his client, right? Um, and, and Wormwood allows um, his client to become a Christian. And, and so the older demon in counseling Wormwood says, here's what you need to do. When he is at church, when he is at church, not the church as we see it, arrayed in splendor, mighty as an army with banner across time and space, draw his attention to the woman who sings off key. Draw his attention to the frumpy man with squeaky shoes. Draw his attention to, and he starts to list out these things that are in every church, always everywhere. And he says, and in seeing these absurdities, he will surely consider that all of this is foolishness. Lewis was diving into this reality that the church, as it's seen in the heavenlies, reveals the bankruptcy and futility of Satan's plans to muddy and destroy, and that the victory already belongs to Christ. So the game then is make people blind to cosmic realities, right? And the enlightenment certainly helps with that, right? Brains on a stick. None of this really exists, This sounds absurd. There's no cosmic reality. There's no red pill, blue pill. This is nonsense. It'd make a great action movie, but it's nonsense. Right? And this is how we've been trained. This is the air that we breathe. And and yet, the, the Bible is telling us that the manifold wisdom of God is made visible in the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So since what we see in these texts is in Christ, Satan vanquished and conquered and the triumph of Christ made sure in his people, how then are we to live? So, so here we are still in stage four, and, and here's what this means. Stage four doesn't look anything like stages one through three. In, in fact, now the weapons of warfare are compassion, mercy, faithful presence, We have been um, illuminated by the Holy Spirit to understand that Christ is king. And and now we live intentional lives on purpose, pushing back the darkness where we are. Now, that's not overwhelmingly complex. All right, we're going to talk about this at length next week. You have been uniquely wired and uniquely placed by God for these purposes, right? Um, you, You have a bent. You had natural gifting when you were born, right? You didn't work at it. It was just there, raw material there, right? So I was born allergic to math but can remember almost everything I read. I didn't learn to do that. I could just do it. Right? Some of you were drawn towards the arts. Other of you, business, you just see it. Other of you are just natural athletes. You can talk about how hard you work. You came out of the womb just better than us, all right? Get over yourself. And, and the same thing's true if you made straight A's, right? You, you're like that. Uh, you, you're that kid's like, oh, man, that test crushed me, and you got 106 on it. We know who you are, all right? You don't have to read anything. You just touch the book, and you become instantly smarter than everyone, right? That, that's God wired you those ways, and then he's placed you where he's placed you for this reason, because we're called up in this. This is the only story there is. And so in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, wherever we find ourselves, we find ourselves in this great cosmic battle, pushing back what's dark with truth and life and love and hospitality and good food and good wine and loving conversation and rich compassion, mourning with those who mourn, celebrating with those who celebrate it and being the people of God where we are. This should be the eradication of boredom to all who claim the name of Jesus Christ because there's eternal significance attached to everything we're doing. But that's not how most of us are why. That's not how most of us think about Christianity. We think about Christianity as kind of navel-gazing. I wish I could stop doing these things. I'm just telling you, the least sexy version of Christianity in the universe is the one that says, just be a better person. There's no mission behind that, no passion behind that, no shaping force behind that. If anything, it makes you self-absorbed. There's nothing uglier than self-absorption and narcissism. right? And I I think that because we're not dialed in to these realities, C.S. Lewis said something else about that. And if you're thinking maybe I've got a thing for Lewis, um, you might be on to something. So um, Lewis also said this. 
It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. Now, what does he mean by that, right? Because we're not Mormons. We, we don't believe, and nor did Lewis believe, that we become gods, but rather that we were adopted as sons and daughters of God. So there's one God. We will not be gods, right? But we, are, we, we will reign and rule alongside of God, redeemed by the blood of Christ forever. So what does Lewis mean? Well, I'm glad he, he defines it. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to Anybody know a guy like that? Listen to what he says. May one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a whore and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. Here, here's Lewis's argument, that, that you and I have been trained by the air that we breathe to not see people, legitimate, eternal people sitting in front of us. The next line of this quote says, you know no mere mortal, that everyone you know is eternal, that you've never met a mere mortal. Countries are mortal, right? Businesses are mortal, but you have never met a mere mortal. Everyone you know is eternal. And Lewis's argument is in eternity, they will be something so beautiful and lovely that if you saw it right now, you'd be tempted to worship it. I think he's referencing 1 Corinthians 15 there in the resurrected body. Or they'll be so grotesque, perverted, and distorted that it would be the stuff of nightmares. And, and I think one of the reasons we haven't embraced kind of being a people with compassion and grace that push back the darkness is because we have lost sight of the bigger picture here. We've lost sight of the bigger picture, and that is the barista that gets you coffee, the waiter that brings your meal and takes your order, that the neighbor that lives beside you, that the friend that you work with, all are not mere mortals. And God has placed you there to be a herald of the good news. So if you're not a Christian and you're here and you're like, oh, this whole God is a warrior thing, man, it's making me feel condemned. No, 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 stage four is not about condemnation. In fact, the Bible's really clear, John 3, 17, that Christ has come into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world from condemnation. Christ coming into the world as a warrior was not about condemning you, but destroying the enemy so that you might be saved. So you can't go, oh, he's so mean. Jesus is so mean. No, no, no. Christ has come to save, to rescue from condemnation, not to condemn. That's what we're celebrating as the people of God, that we have been rescued and ransomed. That's the story of the Bible, that he kicked open the door and drug us out, that he placed our feet on the rock. This is what we're celebrating. This is the good news of the gospel. And so now I'm not saying that you're like, hey, um, can I get um, a, a large black coffee? And, and by the way, I brought you a Bible. Why don't you open that up to Romans 1? Let's talk real quick. That's not what I'm talking about. All right, now, I think there are times where, where just your relationship with someone built over time lends itself to that. Or if you be so bold, you can start spiritual conversations cold just like that. But, but I think it means more that our dinner tables are open and that we do life genuinely and deeply with people that don't believe what we believe, that we love well, and we have compassionate conversations that we seek to understand and we seek to lay before people what is good, right, and beautiful about the God of the Bible. It means we never do drive-by guiltings or, or, or say really foolish things online that could isolate or spark up anger for controversy's sake. This was not the way of Jesus Christ. Well, he rebuked the Pharisees. Bro, the Pharisee is us. The woman caught in adultery, how did he treat her? compassion. Woman at the well, how do you treat her? Compassion. Zacchaeus, the wee little man, did he not go to dinner at his house that day? Yeah, it's with compassion, empathy, grace, patience, genuine friendship that darkness is pushed back. And if you're not a believer, we are in this stage four of warfare where Christ is pushing back with his people darkness. And so if someone is in your ear talking to you about Jesus Christ, that, that is an act of cosmic violence, but earthly love. Earthly love. Stage four will only last so long, so we live intentional lives until stage Five. In stage five, Jesus returns to fight the final battle against his enemies, both spiritual and physical. Let me read Revelation 19, 11 through 16. 
Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. That's many crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of lords. This is a far cry from six pound, three ounce baby Jesus. This is Jesus in a robe dipped in blood with a tattoo on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the day of stage four warfare, which has lasted for millennia of God's patience and mercy, seeking to save and ransom finding many who go, forget your salvation, forget your um, offer to remove all condemnation. We pick, we choose our idols, we choose the other side. He will then, the day of mercy, dried up, and the Bible says the sky cracks open and the return of Christ commences. It's not a long battle Hollywood would like us to believe. It's a long battle, you know, like the priest shows up, the love of Christ compels you. Everybody knows that guy's gonna die, right? That poor priest, the first one that shows up, you can just check it. I don't know how much that guy gets paid for his acting job, but he's there for 10 minutes and then he's dead, right? But, but in the, the final scene uh, of this great war, Jesus shows up and says, I am, and the Bible says it's over forever. And then we return to what we read in Genesis 1 and 2. In fact, the prophet Isaiah says that the deserts bloom with roses, that the, the, the mountaintops produce sweet wine, wine, and that the lamb and the wolf lay down together. They dine together. It's creation remade. Creation remade. For, for the earth to be death-starred, like many Christians think, means that Christ would concede to Satan and give Satan victory. That is not what happens here, but rather All things are remade to the fullness of their glory. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, said, being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing the will of God or doing God's will. So what I want you caught up in is this is what your life is caught up in. Like everything about your life is inside this story. This is the Story. So it doesn't matter what you do. If you're a, a welder or a businesswoman or doesn't matter, a doctor or a teacher or, or a garbage man, it just doesn't matter. This is the story that you and I are fitting into. And every man and woman on earth will bring glory to this God. You, you don't get to choose whether or not you're going to bring glory to this God. Right? You will bring glory to this God by being an object of his grace, a trophy of his grace, putting to open shame the enemy, or you'll be an object of his just right wrath. Even the one that would shake his fist at the heaven and go, I hate you, is still going to bring glory to God. That's what makes this God so terrifying. This is what makes him not Tinkerbell, but something altogether ferocious, loving, yes, gracious, Yes, merciful, yes, long-suffering, absolutely. Tinkerbell, not at all, not at all. Now, again, if you're not a Christian, here's what I desire for you to hear me say. My hope, even in preaching this, because I know how it strikes modern sensibilities, is not to give you ammo to doubt or hate the God of the Bible, but for you to hear that the Lord has made war on your behalf to ransom and rescue you from sin and death and idolatry. And that God's patience is stunning if you think about the belittlement of his name, the mocking and disordering of his creation, the questioning of his character, So I point out to those who are here all the time, like a million planes will take off and land. More than that today. Millions of planes will take off and land today and nobody's gonna go, praise Jesus, this plane landed unless you'd like freak out flying and then you'll be the one that is like, okay, praise Jesus, the plane landed, right? But that's not like a legitimate, isn't God good? But let one fall out of the sky. 
and how cruel and where was God? All right, so if we use last night as an illustration or early morning as an illustration, people club all the time and no one shows up and shoots it up. But God gets no credit for peace, sustained peace. But let one incident break out and watch him come out, mocking, belittling, questioning, and God's response, long-suffering, patience, sending his people to be salt and light, to herald the good news to all who will hear. This is what you're caught up in. This is really what's behind your life. To embrace it and live in it, I think it's the greatest joy we can know. As a Christian, to reject it turns us into navel-gazing moralists. Few things, least, you know, just terrible way to live life. Embracing it means we're marked by compassion, empathy, and love, and we're salt and light, whatever domain we're in. Placed there by the good pleasure of God for the glory of God to be seen. It's a good use of our life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men and women, an opportunity just to stand. And I know so much of what we've talked about today is difficult. It makes other questions kind of pop up in our head. But I pray that just for a moment, Father, we might consider whether these things are true. If there's someone even in here now that that they can just feel in their soul just a a blocking, just I'm not going to consider this, I'm not going to hear this. I I just pray even now, Holy Spirit of God, that you would make them aware that they're doing that right now, that it wouldn't be below the surface, but they would become aware that they refuse to consider, they refuse to think. And I pray for my friends that aren't Christians that they would hear this as good news. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who are Christians that they would grow bold in their faith knowing that the war is won and that they would fight their battles with grace, compassion, hospitality, genuine friendship and long-suffering love and patience. Help us, we need you. It's for your beautiful name I pray, amen.